grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. fragile creatures surrounded by great dangers, we cannot by ourselves stand upright. Give us strength of mind and body, so that even when we suffer because of human sin, we may rise victorious through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading for this 11th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in Isaiah chapter 58. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters never fail. <clears throat> Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight, 
and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. whose words made their hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. The word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. God.
according to Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then, there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Do not, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. So, I'll call him Antonio. It's not his real name, but his story is very real. It was the summer of 1993, and I was doing supervised clinical pastoral education at Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital to fulfill a seminary requirement. One of the other students in my cohort was a woman in her 50s named Marie. Um, she was a lovely woman like all women named Marie, right? <laughs> anyway, Marie was studying to become a Presbyterian pastor. And I remember Marie telling our group the unforgettable story of Antonio, this young man in his 20s who happened to be an undocumented farm worker. Antonio was admitted to the hospital one day when he became weak and collapsed on the job. Tests revealed that he had AIDS, for which there was no good treatment option back then. So late one night when Marie was on call, she was summoned to the emergency room Antonio had smashed the vase on his bedside table and slit his wrists. As Marie sat with him through that long night, she learned that he'd done this out of a deep sense of shame for what he believed to be an unforgivable sin. Antonio told her that he had had a visit from one of the hospital chaplains who had tried to get him to confess his sins, and afterward, the burden of shame he felt had become too great for him to bear. You see, Antonio didn't want his mother or anyone else to find out the secret burden that he'd been carrying for many years. He didn't want her or anyone else to know that because he hadn't been able to find work as a teenager in Mexico, he had sold his body one time in order to put food on his family's table. And that's how he had ended up contracting AIDS. While well, Marie, who was old enough to be Antonio's mother, gently assured him that no matter what he had done, he was a beloved child of God, and she convinced him to let her call his mother. A few days later, his mother was able to travel to Santa Rosa and see her son before he died. Shame was wiped away by grace, and dignity was restored by the power of forgiveness and love. And even though there was no cure, there was healing, and there was freedom for Antonio. There was the healing of being embraced by his mother and the freedom of knowing that he was forgiven, and that nothing could ever separate him from the love of God revealed through Jesus Christ. 
Antonio's story sprang to mind for me this week as I was preparing to preach on this week's story from Luke's gospel. The story in Luke's gospel we just heard is the story of Jesus healing a bent over woman who's been crippled and unable to stand upright for 18 years. Now, when you hear me tell Antonio's story, you might think that his burden was primarily a spiritual one, but it was clearly bound up with the sudden decline in his physical health. In contrast, Luke's story appears to focus on Jesus' healing of the woman's physical ailment. We see that by the time he encounters her in the synagogue, she's been crippled and unable to stand up straight for 18 years. But friends, it doesn't take much imagination to realize that it isn't only physical suffering that's caused her to become bent over. Undoubtedly, her condition can be attributed also to the cumulative weight of many crushing burdens that have been placed on her over the course of those 18 years. Consider this. Because of her physical deformity, this woman has almost certainly had to endure social and economic burdens too. You see, the hunched back that forces her to gaze at the ground is a source of great discomfort, not only for her, but also for everyone else who encounters her. When her neighbors see her coming, they quickly look down or look away. They can't bear to look at her because if they were to actually see her, then they'd have to get involved and interact with her. And they just don't know what to do or how to do that nor do they want to. They don't want to get involved because at some level, they know that if they do get involved, then they will have to acknowledge that they too could just as easily be the one in her sandals. And that's a scary thought. So they effectively ignore or shun this poor woman as though her condition were contagious. And on top of that, some of this woman's fellow worshipers have likely convinced themselves that she's brought this affliction upon herself through some grievous sin. And this mindset then helps them justify their attitude and their behavior toward her. But one Sabbath day, Jesus shows up. He shows up in the synagogue and he blows their narrow mindset out of the water. One moment, Jesus is preaching and teaching. And in the next moment, he looks up from his sermon and he sees this stooped over child of God standing in front of him. And his heart is filled with compassion. Everything stops as Jesus reaches out and offers this person the healing and dignity that she and every child of God deserve. I wonder, have you ever stopped to think about how the woman feels in that moment? As Luke tells the story, it's pretty clear she's initially overjoyed to find that she's suddenly been healed. Finally, after all these years, she's able to stand tall and look people in the eye. Finally, she's able to lift her hands and her face up to the heavens and give praise to God. And so she does, because she can. I also wonder how that newly healed woman feels a moment later, when the leader of the synagogue, instead of rejoicing and praising God for the miracle that's taken place, objects to her healing because it technically breaks the law. In a nutshell, he argues that healing is work and is therefore prohibited on the Sabbath day. Now, you should know, and I think you do, that this isn't the first time that Jesus has been confronted with that particular argument. In fact, the passage we have before us today is the third of four stories in Luke's gospel in which Jesus heals on the Sabbath. It's also the fifth of six stories that take place on the Sabbath. And in every single one of those Sabbath stories, Jesus' words and deeds provoke conflict. In any case, in today's text, 
Jesus calls out the leader of the synagogue and the other religious leaders for their hypocrisy in lifting up the letter of the law while attempting to quench its spirit. In his reprimand, Jesus makes the point that since divine Sabbath law offers provisions for the health and well-being of animals, it surely extends to caring for a fellow human being created in the image and likeness of God. As Jesus reminds us elsewhere, the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. Another thing that strikes me is the verb Jesus uses when he addresses the woman. He says to her, you are set free from your ailment. Now, what you need to know here is that in the original New Testament Greek, the verb is apoluo, which means to set free, to release, or, wait for it, to forgive. Ah. So when Jesus says to someone, your sins are forgiven, it could also be translated, your sins are released, or your sins are set free. You've been set free from your sins. So why do I bring this up? I mention it because Jesus comes to set you and me and all God's children free from the things that afflict or burden us, from the demons of shame and guilt, from the torture of anxiety and depression, from the power of addiction, from the debilitating effects of grief and trauma, from the paralyzing grip of fear and self-centeredness, and the list goes on. Of course, as I touched on with the story of Antonio, because we are mortal beings, healing isn't always possible in this earthly lifetime. However, through Jesus, we see that God's loving desire to heal and reconcile the whole human family has broken into this world, and God's gift of abundant life endures forever. So I said, I said healing isn't always possible. What I mean is cure isn't always possible. Let me clarify that. Physical cure. So truth be told, there are many ways to hear the story of the bent over woman and how she was healed by Jesus. And each of us We'll hear it a little differently through the filter of our own life experience. I remember that when I first heard this story as a young adult, I heard it in a very personal sense. Um, as one who had carried a long t for a long time the weight of some unseen burdens imposed by others and just by the circumstances of life, I took heart in this amazing good news that even though other people couldn't or wouldn't see my burdens, more importantly, Jesus saw them and he saw me. And on that day, it dawned on me that because Jesus sees me with eyes of love, he's come to set this bent over woman free from fear and from all the other things that conspire to hold me back and keep me down, just as he set free that bent over woman all those years ago. But wait, there's more. When my young adult self straightened up, and raised my head to revel in this newfound freedom, I also began to see more clearly that Jesus wants to extend that very same life-giving, liberating power to everyone, especially to those who are weary and carrying heavy burdens. So from where I sit today, I hear this story from Luke's gospel in a more communal sense. I can't help noticing that Jesus' act of healing and setting free the bent over woman takes place in a synagogue, in a house of God, right? They're worshiping just like you and I are. This is a place of worship. And so it leads me to wonder, how many times do people who are carrying heavy burdens come into our house of worship? And what awaits them when they dare to step through our doors? And I use the word dare because um, I'm sure it takes a lot of courage for some of them to set foot in a church building. But I would bet it happens every day 
Even though you and I might not ever know it, it happens all the time here at Zor and other church buildings too, because human bur- burdens often, in fact, most often aren't visible to the human eye. In all honesty, I can't help wondering why some of those bruised and broken ones would even want to venture into a church because let's face it, they have good reason to expect that they might be met with the same kind of legalistic judgment the synagogue leader dished out. Ouch. Instead of being met by the grace-filled compassion of our Lord. Take a minute to think about your own experience. At some point in your life, you have been, you are, or you will be the one who is weighed down by a heavy burden. And I wonder, how, in those times when you're carrying heavy burdens, how many of you have stayed away from church, either here or elsewhere, because you were afraid of being judged or having further hurt inflicted on you? If you're brave, raise your hand. Yeah, okay. Um, on the flip side, and but in a similar vein, how many of you or your loved ones in spite of having a heavy burden, have somehow managed to overcome your fears and drag your weary bodies to worship only to have your worst fears confirmed by fellow Christians who either looked away or went out of their way to shame you or your loved ones and let let it be known that you weren't welcome in their community. Anybody ever have that experience? I know people who have, so I'll say yes. I'll say, I personally haven't had that one, but I've, I've known people who have. Yeah, that's that's painful. And if that message makes you squirm, as it does me, then perhaps that's a sign that we need to sit with the message for a while and ask ourselves, why does it make us so uncomfortable? Is it because deep down we know that we're more like the leader of the synagogue than we care to admit? Are we afraid that we... that? when others are healed and set free, it somehow diminishes our own power, that is, our sense of order and control. And finally, by our action and inaction, are we the ones who are heaping um, yet more burdens on those whom Jesus wants to set free, intentionally or unintentionally? So as we ponder these questions in the midst of the growing pains of our own discomfort, You and I should also keep in mind those parts of today's scripture readings where both Isaiah and Jesus warn that keeping the Sabbath commandment goes way beyond just engaging in orderly worship and abstaining from our usual work routine. Indeed, the very fact that this commandment to keep Sabbath is rooted in the creation story and then reiterated in the Exodus story teaches us that God intends Sabbath as a gift, a gift to sustain all human beings and set us free from bondage so that we may have fullness of life. And until all God's children are set free, none of us will ever be truly free because our freedom and our well-being are bound up with the freedom and the well-being of our neighbors. And that brings me to one last observation about today's gospel reading. To put it bluntly, in contrast to the apoplectic religious leaders who jump up and down and say, not today, woman, not today, people, come back another day and be healed. Jesus never says, sorry, I can't heal you today because it's the Sabbath, right? He never says, you'll have to make an appointment and come back another day. On the contrary, as I've already indicated, Jesus himself declares the Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. And friends, for you and me who are disciples of Jesus, that means that today is the day for healing. In fact, since every day is the Lord's day, every day is the proper time for reaching out and loving our neighbors in a way that brings healing and freedom and raises them up to live as their best true selves, as beloved children of God, and shining reflections of the radiant love and glorious light of our gracious creator God. 
And so we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Amen. extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. You crown your church with steadfast love and mercy. Guide us continually in our baptismal covenant to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Use our diverse gifts in service to the whole people of God. Merciful God, we receive our prayers. You satisfy the needs of all creatures, protect the habitats of fish and birds, repair ecosystems damaged by misuse, neglect, or natural disaster, that all creation may thrive. Merciful God, we receive our prayer. You make known ways, make your ways known to all people. Inspire the rulers and leaders of nations with your compassion and mercy. Raise up activists and community organizers to restore places affected by violence, poverty, and inequity. Merciful God, receive our prayers. You provide justice for all who are oppressed and relief to all who are afflicted. Heal those who are bent over by addiction, depression, and anxiety. Set free all who cry out under the weight of mental, emotional, or physical distress. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You hear our prayers as we pray for all those on the Zohar prayer list, 
for their families and their caregivers, and you hear the others that we name in our hearts and minds. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You call us to delight in the Sabbath. Renew our bodies, minds, and spirits in this worshiping assembly. Give, us, give rest to all who lead our congregation in worship, study, and service. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, you are the source of all healing and of life. We ask that you would be with all who are in need of your healing touch. And today we add to our prayers Donna Martz um, at, with, at home with sprained foot. And you are also the source of protection. You gather us under your wings and carry us like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. So we ask that you would protect Jody as she travels to Boston, grant her a safe flight, and may there be better weather um, on the East Coast and elsewhere. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Generations, bless your holy name. We give you thanks for the communion of saints who have gathered in prayer and praise in this place. Support us in your love until we rest forever in you. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, O God, and hold us forever in your merciful and steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. One, two, three. May the, the peace, peace of Christ, Christ be Christ with you always. always. You have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Receive God's blessing. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.
in peace. Love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.